Angela. And I actually, some of you here might not know me, okay? So I want to tell you a little bit about myself, okay? So I actually grew up right here in Ottawa. And um, I grew up in the south side. Anybody from South Keys? Yeah, no, I thought so. It's okay. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. So I grew up in South Keys with my mom and my brother. And so my mom, she, when we were growing up, she was a single mom. And so she took care of us on her own. And so growing up, we actually joined this program called Big Brothers and Big Sisters. Does anybody here know that? Okay, come on, I see you, let's go. That's awesome. And so Big Brothers and Big Sisters is a program where they, men they pair children up with mentors, adult mentors, and they take you out, they hang out with you, and they just help you walk through life. And so I had a big sister, and we used to play sports together. We would play soccer, basketball, we'd go biking. She was very athletic, all right? And so one day, my big sister came to me, and she said, Angela, um, do you want to try and go skiing? And I said, pause for a second, I don't do winter sports. And, and growing up, like, I never really did them. So, like, when she said, do you want to go skiing, I was like, wow, I've never done that before. So I was like, you know, sure, why not? I have no reason to be afraid. Let's go skiing. And so I was actually really excited. And so we went to the hill. We, we got there. We had way too many layers on. <laughs> we went and we went on the bunny hill. Y'all know the bunny hill? Yeah, we got some skiers in the house. Okay, okay. So <laughs> we went on the bunny hill and I was going down. I was like, ooh, 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 killing it, okay? <laughs> I was feeling good. I was confident. And so we finished on the bunny hill and my big sister was like, okay, I think you're ready for something a little more, you know, a little harder, right? Like some intermediate level stuff. And I was like, okay, she thinks I'm good. I must be good. I was confident, okay? I was confident. And so we go up the ski lift and we get on the top of the hill. And so like, we get to the top of the hill and it was like more like a mountain. So like, we looked down and I was like, hmm, like this is pretty big, you know? And, um, and my big sister looked stressed. So I was stressed. And she was like, um, we actually are on an expert hill, okay? Like, I'm talking like the Black Diamond Hill. And so I was like, <laughs> Black Diamond, okay? So we <laughs> were like, okay. So she's like, okay, we're gonna get down this hill, but I'm gonna help you go down the hill. I'll lead you through it. She was an expert skier, like she was really good. And she was teaching me. So she's like, I'll be right beside you the whole time, okay? So she's off to the side and she starts teaching me how to go down the hill. So I knew the pizza, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, oh, <laughs> that guy, he knows, let's go. Okay, I knew the pizza, I knew it all. So I was like, okay, cool. So we're going down the hill and we're going from side to side, just like this and this. And I was listening to her and I was going side to side. And then all of a sudden, my skis like just went straight. And so I started to go straight down the hill, okay? And um, I started to go faster and faster and faster. And there was people in the way, there was children. They were jumping out of the way. I'm really ashamed of that. It's okay though, I was in high school. Anyways, so they were jumping out of the way and I was going down this hill so fast. And my big sister was yelling at me. She was saying stuff. And all I heard was her saying, heels down, heels down. So I was like, bet. So I started to drive my heels into the snow and I started to go even faster. And I was like, oh my goodness. So I was going faster and faster and I was so afraid. Like I just did not want to get hurt. And so I was, I was barely even understanding anything. I was so focused on my fear. I was like, I don't know what's going on. So my big sister, it actually turned out that she was saying, sit down, sit down. <laughs> so like technically if I sat down, like I wouldn't be in this situation right now. Anyways, <laughs> it's okay. So she said, sit down, but I didn't know. So I was going straight down this hill. We go to the bottom of the hill, there's a tree and I end up jumping out of the way and I just bah, fall on the snow. And I was alive, you know, obviously I was alive because I'm here now. Anyways, I was alive, so I was like, huh? And my big sister says, are you okay? <laughs> and so we're gonna put a pin in that story. We're gonna leave it right there. But right now, it's Student Takeover Sunday. And today we're really gonna see how God can use generations to make a difference in his kingdom, All right? And I believe that each of you in here right now have something so special that God has deposited inside of you to use to make a difference in his kingdom. And I believe that there's people around us, all around us, who have such beautiful gifts that God has given them. But I think that when we choose not to listen to the voices and the wisdom of those that are around us, we can be led down a path that is not good, right? And so 
When we see that, the people around us have something so special inside of them. I think when we take time to listen to those that are around us and see that God has deposited something special in them to impact the generations. And I think that when we see that, we can work together and see that God can actually work miracles in his kingdom. And so today, we're going to be talking about that. And we're really going to unpack that through the story of Elijah and Elisha. But before we do, let's pray. So around here, we do, in, in junior high, we do this thing called prayer positions. So I'll say prayer positions, and we'll clap our hands together. But it has to be at like the same time, okay? Okay, here we go. Prayer positions! Oh, that was nice. Okay, well, God, thank you so much for today. Lord, I thank you so much for the opportunity to just share your word. God, I pray for those in this place um, that are just needing to hear from you, God. I pray that you would speak to our hearts today. And God, show us exactly what it is that you want to say. We're all facing different situations, Lord, so would you speak directly to us and help us to hear from you and to hear from heaven. We love you, God, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. Sweet. So, like I said, today we're going to be looking at the story of Elijah and Elisha. Everybody say, Elijah and Elisha. You guys got it. You're pros. Wow. Okay. So we're going to be looking at the story of Elijah and Elisha. And so Elijah was an incredible prophet. He did amazing things for God. And he actually took Elisha on as his disciple. And so when we look in the Bible, we can find Elijah and Elisha in the Old Testament in the books of Kings. And so when Elijah was around, there was this evil king named Ahab. Everybody say Ahab. Ahab. Yes, so there was this evil king named Ahab, and he was actually leading the people of Israel away from worshiping God and leading them to worship other gods. And so Elijah came, and and God called him to speak to King Ahab. And so they basically end up having this huge face-off on this mountain. Mountains, well, um, <laughs> on this mountain, and um, Elijah faces off against his, uh, uh, King Ahab's gods, right? And so it turns out that obviously God shows up. Elijah calls down fire on this mountain. It's crazy, and God shows that He is the true God of Israel. And so this is Elijah. He's doing incredible things for God. And so after this, we see that God calls Elijah to actually get Elijah to be a prophet. And he wants him to anoint him to be this next prophet and to actually be his disciple. And so Elijah does it. He finds Elisha. And um, they start to journey together. And they're walking together. And they're seeing God do incredible things. And right now, it leads us where we're going to be today. At the end of their story, where we really see Elijah being taken up to heaven. And Elisha staying to continue the prophetic ministry of Elisha. And so that's where we're going to find ourselves today. So we're going to read the Bible. We're going to read the Word of God. And we're going to go into 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. So if you have your Bible, you can pull it out. And we're going to read it together. You ready? Yes? Okay, let's read. Verse 2. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elisha, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel, and the sons of the prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elijah and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he said, Yes, I know it. Keep quiet. Elijah said to him, Elisha, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The sons of the prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said, to him, do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he answered, yes, I know it. Keep quiet. And so we see here in the story of Elijah and Elisha that Elijah's about to be taken up to heaven. He's about to, to leave. And they both seem to have an understanding that this is going to happen. And so we're really seeing um, the end of their relationship there on earth. But we're actually going to be seeing that Elijah is going to be taken up to heaven. And so that's kind of where we're at in the story right now. And Elisha is kind of understanding that he's about to leave, um, but they're all kind of seeing it unfold right now. And so let's continue. Then Elijah said to him, please stay here for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the sons of the prophets also went and stood at some distance from them, and they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his cloak and rolled it up and struck the water, and the water was parted to the one side and to the other, till the two of them could go over on dry ground. Just a whole miracle right there. 
When they crossed to the, um, when they crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, "Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you." And Elisha said, please, let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. And he said, you have asked a hard thing. Yet, if you see me as I'm being taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if you do not see me, it shall not be so. And as they still went on and talked, behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw him no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. And he took up the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. Wow. So right here, we kind of see the conclusion of their, uh, Elijah and Elisha's walk together. And so we know that Elijah was Elisha's mentor and Elisha was Elijah's disciple. And so um, here we see Elijah's taken up to heaven and Elisha is left to carry on the prophetic ministry of Elisha. And so when I look at this story, I, there's such a beauty as we talk about generations and how we can work together. I think we really see that through the story of Elijah and Elisha. And in this story, I see three different focuses that I'd love for us to talk about today. So we're going to unpack that together. So the first focus I see is Elijah's focus. So In this story, Elijah was continually focused on a few things. And one of the things that we can see he was focused on was that he was focused on testing Elisha. We see in verses here in verse 2 when it says, And Elijah said to Elisha, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. And so here we see Elijah continually testing Elisha. And he's testing his commitment right here. He's seeing, will you be committed not only to our relationship, but also to seeing the people of Israel restored? Because Elisha was to carry on the ministry of Elijah. And so here we see that Elijah's really focused on seeing if Elisha is committed to following these two beautiful things. And so that is one of Elisha's focuses here. Another focus that we see Elijah really focusing on is, is actually being obedient to the voice of God. So when we look in this story, in verses 4 and 6, it says, Elijah said to him, Elijah, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as you yourself live, as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. And so right here in these verses, we see that Elijah was listening to God. It says, for the Lord sent me. And so he was focused on being obedient to listening to the voice of God because he knew the value of following and listening to God. And in doing so, he actually modeled for Elisha what it looked like to listen and to be obedient to the voice of God. And so in this, he actually showed up as an amazing mentor, modeling what does it look like for me to follow God. And I pray that as you see it, you can do the same. Right? And so Elijah really modeled for Elisha what it looked like to just be obedient to God. And the last thing I see in Elijah in his focus is that he knew that his time was limited. All around in the story, we see the prophets talking to Elisha, reminding him that his mentor is leaving. And I believe Elisha also had some kind of understanding. Because when we see in verse 9, it says, when they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, please let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. And so here, Elijah knew his time was limited. And instead of living in fear and seeing that his time was limited, he actually had a healthy heart posture because he chose to say, how can I serve you, Elisha? How can I teach you? How can I help you actually grow so that when I go, you're actually able to move forward and continue on in this ministry? And so he was really looking at how can I wholeheartedly follow God and lead others to do the same as he was leaving. And so Elijah really knew that his time was limited. And so when we look at the story of Elijah and Elisha, I think it's so beautiful to see the gifts that God gave them and how they were moving and working for God and his kingdom. But the thing is, God doesn't want to just use Elijah and Elisha. God wants to use you too. God has placed something so special inside of you. There is gifts that you have that I cannot do and that other people here cannot do. But God has gifted you with it and blessed you with it so that you can use it to minister to those around you. And so just like Elijah and Elisha, we have to see how can I use the gifts that God has given me to pour out to the people that are around me. we got to be future focused and see that God wants to use some of those gifts. And so 
there is something so special that God has put in you. And we always got to be seeing, okay, God, how can I pour into somebody else? And this just isn't a call for the older generations to pour into the younger generations. I think that's beautiful to, to really pour into those that are coming up behind you. But I also think that the younger generations can pour into the older generations. And why do I say that? Because I believe we all have something of value to share with each other. And so it doesn't matter if we're older or younger. God wants to use you. And so there's something so beautiful that's found in actually listening to God, submitting to him, and then actually allowing him to use you for other people as well. And so when I see the story of Elijah and Elisha, it gets me excited because Elijah really sets the example for us to be like, whoa, okay, I have something and I want to pour into other people too, right? And so another focus that we see in this story is Elisha's focus, okay? So he was focused on a few things as well. Here in the story, we see that Elisha knew that Elijah wasn't going to be around for very long. And so we see that in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 3. And when, he, when the sons of the prophets continually to come to him and he says, yes, I know, keep quiet right? Why is he saying, yes, I know, keep quiet? The prophets are coming to him over and over again and telling him, do you know your master is going to be leaving today? And it happens many times, and he says, yes, I know, keep quiet, right? And so here, Elisha knew that Elijah wasn't going to be around very long, so he treasured every moment. And I love that heart posture. He looked to see, how can I receive, how can I learn from Elijah, from my mentor, before he goes? And so he treasured every moment. Another thing that we see is that Elisha was committed to remaining with Elijah. We see that in these verses. You guys already know what it says in verse 4 and 6 when Elisha tells him to stay. He says, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. And it seems like Elijah was really commanding Elisha to stay. And Elisha was like, no, he had committed and resolved in his heart that he was going to follow Elijah. And so he committed to following him. Why? Because that was his mentor. And he wanted to learn from it, walk with him, and and be committed to seeing the people of Israel restored. And so this is such a beautiful, beautiful thing. So Elisha was committed to remaining with Elijah. And we see in the story that the prophets continuously come to Elisha to tell him, do you know today your pastor will take him from over you? And they say it over and over and over again. They keep reminding him. And I think that sometimes we need constant reminders to honor and to value the people that are around us and the generations that are around us, whether it's the one who's come before us or come after. I think we need those reminders to honor the people around us and celebrate because we're really celebrating what God is doing around us. And so we got to honor people. Be like, yo, you're incredible. Thank you for how you've impacted my life. And so I think it's so important to honor those that are around us. And so the last thing that we see in Elisha's focus is that Elisha did not desire Elijah's popularity, but he actually desired his spirit, right? So we see this in verse 9 when it says, when they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, ask what I shall do for you before I'm taken away from you. And Elisha said, please let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. Here we really see Elisha's heart posture. He was so focused, not on Elijah's popularity, but on his spirit. He saw how the impact that an individual has when they're living in close proximity to God. And he saw that, man, Elijah is moving in power because he has a close relationship with God and he's doing incredible things. And he said, I want that too. And so Elisha's heart treasured the right things. He treasured to have this amazing proximity to God and see God do even more incredible things in his life, just like he did in Elijah's life. Wow. So Elisha was really focused on not just the popularity, but actually what God was using Elisha for. And so when we look at this story of Elijah and Elisha, I think we can see that Elisha took time to learn and glean from Elijah. And I think that we have that calm responsibility too, to learn and glean from the people that are around us. Because the thing is, the person to your left and to your right, they all have something so special that God has uniquely created them to do and for. And so I think that when we look to the people that are beside us, we can actually say, hey, how can I learn from you? How can I glean from you? And so this is a call for us too, for all generations to learn and understand how can I actually learn from the person who's beside me and grow in that. I would not be here today without the mentors that took time to build into my life, to pour into me. I would not be here. And so I am so grateful for them who just poured into me and loved me. And so I think we really got to learn from the people that are around us and have that perspective, right? 
And so as we look at this idea of generations working together, um, the one thing that we see here is God's focus. And we know that ultimately God's plan would prevail. And it wouldn't be just about a person or a generation being restored, but about his people being restored to him. And when we look in the story of Elijah and Elisha, he knew that what, ha- what started in the life of Elijah would be continued through the life of Elisha. And so God has this beautiful, beautiful heart to see that it's going to continue. And both of these individuals were equipped to make a difference for God in his kingdom. And so when we look at the story of Elijah and Elisha, what do we see? I think we see that we need each other. We need each other. Elijah needed Elisha. Elisha needed Elijah. And we need one another. You need the person to the left of you. You need the person three rows in front of you. (laughs) You need the people around you. Because God has not created us to be alone, but to work together and to be together and live life together. And so we need each other. We need each other. And so as we go forward to really see how can we work together as generations, I think that there's three focuses that we can have as we go on this journey. I think the first focus we can think of is calling. What is your call? And what do I mean when I say that? What is God asking you to do, right? God has called us to go out and make disciples of all nations, all nations. And I think that we have to listen to God and say, God, how have you asked me to answer this call to go out and make disciples and really see people come to know Jesus and develop them and walk with them. I think the second thing that we can focus on is honor. Oftentimes, we can be so focused on the differences that we have between other people that we actually miss out on what God is doing through them. And so I think that we need to really look at each other and honor each other and not be so focused on our differences that we forget to celebrate what God is doing. And so I think we need to walk in a hard posture of honor towards each other and see God just use that. And the last thing I think we need to focus on is unity. Unity is so beautiful. We have 613 United. You guys already know. Some of you here. It's the name of our youth group. And I think that unity is something that's so important that God has created us for. And unity comes with time, connection, and a common purpose. And so I believe as the body of Christ, we got to live life together. We can't just live our lives and not interact as generations. We got to live together. We got to talk to one another and work towards unity. And I believe that when we do that, God can just do incredible things. And so we're not meant to be separated based on our age, but we're actually meant to be united as the body of Christ because we're all his children anyways. (laughs) And so we need to focus on actually walking in love and, and just humility towards one another and work towards unity. And so if you can take anything away from this message today, I think the bottom line is that if we are going to effectively build God's house, we need what God has deposited in every generation working together. We need it. Come on. That's beautiful. We need every single thing that God has deposited in each generation to work together. And so in order to do that, we can do three things. So we're going to have, I'm going to say some points here. Feel free to write them down. These are some things that we can do moving forward. So the first thing is calling. Let us recognize our calling to model a life submitted to Christ for the next generation. The second thing is honor. Let us recognize, be grateful, and honor what each generation prior to us has done in terms of building God's house. And the third thing is unity. Let us both mentor and be mentored in community. We are not called to be separated by our generations. We are called to glean and learn from each other. And so if we go back to my story, let's take a pin out of it, okay? Remember, I'm going down this mountain, okay? Wow. (laughs) So I'm going down. And as I'm going down, my big sister was right beside me. But I was so focused on my fear that I actually couldn't hear her, her voice and hear what she was saying to me right beside me. And I think that sometimes we can be so focused on fear that we miss out on the people that are actually right around us. And so I think that when we let go of fear, we can actually have confidence in what God is doing and that he is actually with us. And we don't need to hold on to fear anymore. We can let it go because God is actually the one who's with us. And he's strong enough to help us and to hold us, right? And so uh, in youth, we had some awesome leaders create this amazing chant. And it says this, there's 365 days in a year. That's how many times God says, don't fear. And it's just bars, like, wow. 
got some rappers in youth. <laughs> and so I think when we look at this line, I thought it would be so powerful for us to say this together. And so I'm going to say the first part. There's 365 days in a year. That's how many times God says, and y'all will say, don't fear. You got it? Let's do it together. There's 365 days in a year. That's how many times God said. There's 365 days in a year. That's how many times God said. A little louder. There's 365 days in the year. That's how many times God said. Okay. Oh my goodness. Wow. I believe you. I believe you. And so I believe you. I will not be afraid. And so let's not be afraid to allow what God has put in us to be used for his kingdom. He's put something in you. Don't forget it. Please don't leave here today thinking that I am worthless. I, I don't have anything to give. No, you do. And God's put it in you. And get yourself around some people who can tell you the same thing. Stay in community. Let's continue to honor one another. And let's look at how we can disciple other people so that others can come to know Jesus. Because the thing is, it's not about us anyways. It's about other people coming to know Jesus and knowing who he is. And that's how we really actually experience a real and full life. And so it's not about us anyways. But, oh my goodness, sorry. Whew, okay. <laughs> sorry. But I think that God wants to do something so special in the generations. And so I think we should take a moment and pray over each generation. And I'm going to invite up two awesome individuals to come pray. And we're going to pray over each generation. And I'm believing that we will see generations move and make a big difference in God's kingdom. Do you believe it? Come on, I believe it. So we're going to pray together, and you can join us as we pray. Woo! Was that powerful? Wow, Pastor Angela. So, so powerful. So, so powerful. Well, Vienna and I are um, just honored to, to lead in prayer. Um, so we're going to pray for the generations, and um, we're going to pray over the younger generation first. Um, you know, the Bible actually gives a little bit of a clue as to, you know, how long a generation is. It's usually considered within a span of 30 years, some say 35, but recently I know some tried to push it to 40, so, but, uh, <laughs> but I would say just stand up if you're in the young generation, the students, um, young adults, stand up. We want to pray for you. We want to bless you and honor you this morning, so, yeah, okay. Praise God. And, and um, yes. Yes. And so I just want to invite the older generation, stretch your hands out. And if your children and grandchildren are not here, they're standing in proxy for your family. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the most precious gift that our preschoolers, students, and young adults are to the body of Christ. Thank you for the innate desire you gave them to connect with you. And as they listen to your word, may the seeds planted in them yield a bountiful harvest in their spirit. May they learn to cast all their cares upon you, knowing that regardless of circumstances around them, your purpose and your plans for them cannot be derailed. May they say yes to the call, your call, while they are young. Just like Jeremiah did when you said to him, do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you to. May they wisely steward the unprecedented influence you have given the, their generation through social media platforms, using their influence to bring glory and honor to God. And create a hunger in them for the deep things of God, for repentance, righteousness, and obedience. Refresh them with the living waters of revival. May they reap where their parents and their grandparents have sown. And what the enemy stole from the generations before them may be paid back multiple fold in their generation. And so together, as an older generation, we prophesy the following over you by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I just want you to open up your hands and receive this as a, as a prophecy over you. We prophesy a distinctive season of prodigals returning home. 
to be robbed by God in their true identity and position to claim their true inheritance. You will flee temptation and contend to see God's kingdom come and His will done in your generation. You will be carriers of God's presence and you will see chains of oppression, addictions, confusion, depression, self-hate and anxiety broken over your generation. You will be a generation humble and submitted to God as his hands and feet in your educational institutions, sharing the good news with signs and wonders following. And we ask for an impact so great that for every young life the enemy ended prematurely, a thousand young lives will be saved. And you would be marked by clarity of purpose and your identity centered in Christ. Truth, righteousness, and unity will be a hallmark of this generation. In your youth, you will set an example to all believers in love, faith, and purity. And for our young men, we prophesy 1 John 2.14 over you, which says, I have written to you, young men, because you are strong. The word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. And for our young women, we prophesy Esther 4.14b over you. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. And so as the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him, may he find faith in your generation. In Jesus' name. beautiful and we're just going to invite the rest of you to actually stand as well and we're just going to pray another prayer over the older generation heavenly father we thank you for the elders you've placed in our lives we thank you for those who stood alongside our parents and supported our upbringing we thank you for our church mothers and fathers who have encouraged us and prayed for us let us not take for granted the value in hearing the testimonies of those who came before us Lord, let their faith teach us how to live in faith. Let their patience inspire us to wait and let their unwavering joy spread to us. We thank you for the leadership you have given us so that we may grow into young men and women after your own heart. Help them to understand the impact they can have on a young person's life. Lord, help them to grasp the power and authority that you have given them. Give them confidence as they continue to enter their places of work in their homes, that they may know that you go with them, God, that they may feel your presence in every area of their lives. Empower this generation, O oh God, that they may each know that your purposes and plans in their lives are still coming to completion, that as long as there is breath in their lungs, you, O oh God, are going to do a new thing. Lord, give them faith to believe that despite their past mistakes, that you are still good. You said that a good father gives good gifts to his kids. So Lord, bless this generation and grant them favor. Give them the wisdom of Solomon, give them the bravery of David, and may you supply them every need according to your riches and glory in Jesus Christ. The body of Christ is not complete without them. Please help them never to forget how vital they are to the kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome. Wow, I'm so thankful for all of you that are here and for each generation. And I think that God is going to do some incredible things, and he already is doing incredible things in his kingdom. And I think that when we say that, I know I was passionate saying that it's not about us anyways. And when I say that, God loves you and cares for you. And he sees you and he knows you. But I also know that there's a world outside of this win our window, outside of this church, that needs what God has deposited in every single generation to shine out for all to see. And so I believe that we can do this and we can allow God to move in our hearts that the world outside of our windows will be able to see him shine and continue to choose to say, you know what, maybe I want to follow Jesus too. Maybe I want it to be in my life. 